Way, good to see you, brother. What's going on, Abibi? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for sitting with me. Where are you in the world today? I am uh, in Singapore, where I have been for the last year, and uh, it's been the longest time I've ever spent continuously in Singapore in my I life. Because the world is literally your oyster. You are jetting all the time. Did you enjoy the time off a bit, or is it been I have to say, I, I try to look at it as positively as possible, right? So it's been great for, for example, from a perspective of writing, uh, from a perspective of team building. Um, I've just gotten myself a new puppy, so that's something I probably wouldn't have had. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. Her name is Bandit. She's a long-haired miniature dachshund. Uh, she's really cool. It's funny, I was just telling you earlier, like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit late to this broadcast because I... I'm in the middle of potty training my dog. Uh, so so it's really funny actually, because like my dog trainer was like, so what you need to do is you set like intervals, right? So let, let's say it's a three hour interval. Um, so after your dog goes to the, the toilet, you know, pees or poops or whatever, then you've got an hour uh, of freedom for her. Then you've got an hour of supervision. Then you do like an hour or 45 minutes in her crate if she's comfortable there. So you're like basically supercharging her bladder so that when she, you bring her outside, she's like, okay, I'm ready to pee. Right? To go. <laughs> yeah. And then you positively re reinforce that. You give her a treat and some praise and so on like that. And I'm like, and she's like, you got to write this all down. I'm like, no, dude, I don't need to write anything down. You know why? Because I have a flyback chronograph with an hour <laughs> with an hour counter, motherfucker. Right? <laughs> so, so as soon as like I see pee coming out of my dog or or poop coming out of my dog, I just hit the reset button on my flyback. Um, uh, uh, well, I mean, I've got this beautiful Shapar Alpine Eagle chronograph. So it's I've got a flyback function. It's got an hour counter, so I can count down to three hours, you know. And it's best of all, it's vertical clutch, right? So, clutch, so you can leave it running like all day long, which I am doing, and it doesn't have any sort of um, erosive effect on the uh, amplitude of the, the time. Amazing. Time. So you already you already tackled the issue. What is it for, and why yes. you mentioned it? Motherfucker, yes. I was waiting for the first one. It's in your title on, yes. The, yes. and we immediately rolled into the wrist check. So oh, okay. show your watch. Yes, yes. So there you go. That's, that's the beast. You know, let me take it off, actually. And I have to say, like, this this watch is dope, man. You know, it's funny, though, like, when I first saw the images of it, I wasn't uh, sure what size it was. Um, and I thought maybe it'd be more in alignment with, like, let's say, like, a Royal Oak Chrono, right? Yeah. But it's actually much more the size of, like, an offshore Chrono. So it's a beast, yeah. but it's a very beautifully resolved Are you watch. loving it? I, I, I really dig it, dude. Amazing. Congrats. I, I really dig it, yeah. So I was racking my brain what I should wear today besides being rakish because I love the rake and we didn't mention it, but we skipped the whole intro part, but I do want you to do a quick intro for those sure, sure. that don't know you. And that's very limited because we got a lot of positive feedback and a lot of questions from the viewers that want to ask you questions. But since it's Tuesday and I do know you love speedy watches as well, I put my Tintin on. That's awesome, bro. I got my, I got my, uh, I got a speedy here as well. I got my Snoopy 50th anniversary. There you go. Amazing. So you got it already. I, you know, I was lucky enough to get uh, allocated one. So I, I'm very so pleased. Reynold, Reynold uh, really loves you. Well, Reynold's a wonderful human being. First of all, he's extremely, mm -hmm. he's, he's very handsome and being extremely superficial, I'm attracted to good looking people. So that, that's, uh, that was, <laughs> no, but in, in addition to that, like it's, you know, here you have a guy that is like, um, the, you know, he's the leader of one of the biggest brands in the world, you know, but he's like also one of the most approachable people. He's like one of the most sincere, sincere people. He's like, if you look on social media, for example, like anywhere there's like a cool, um, uh, you know, a speedy like post, he's like liked it, you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's he's very aware, he's very connected. And, you know, he has to be, he's the guy that, that innovated, you know, launching a watch over social media like Speedy Tuesday. And, um, and he's a good, he's just a great human being. So no, he's amazing, he's amazing, he's a stand-up guy. Yeah. So that's a beautiful bridge for an intro to you because I want to briefly introduce you. I've known of you for many years because when Revolution Magazine came out, I was a kid. I was blown away. Um, I introduced in the writing texts of the post for this session today that you guys revolutionized, and that's not a word, pun and no pun intended, the watch industry. Because you guys made watches sexy. You guys made the most amazing photo shoots. And you guys are the inspiration for the small stuff we do on Ace Photo Studio. 
Um, but you always married it with very high-end writing, very intellectual, authentic, uh, a passion for watchmaking, very technical as well. And um, if I'm not mistaken, correct me if I'm wrong, you guys were the first ever to do collabs with watches besides yeah. retailers. Am I correct? I think so. Um, and we started uh, all the way back in uh, 2013 uh, with a, a Royal Oak. Actually, you know, the, the biggest regret is I, I never uh, we never put Revolution on that watch, but we did um, a 20 piece limited edition of the Royal Oak Offshore with AP. And that watch was a watch where, you know, I, I love the original Royal Oak from 1993, you know, and I just wanted to do kind of an homage to that watch on the anniversary of that watch, but with um, AP's, AP's in house movement, movement instead of the, um, the Jaeger 2121. And uh, amazingly, uh, they said yes. They even put a sapphire case back on it. Um, and so, yeah, we started off in that. And all 20 pieces, the deal was they were sold in Singapore. Everyone was invited to a dinner um, right before the Singapore F1. And then everyone was invited by my buddy, uh, Oliviero Bottinelli, to um, go watch the, uh, the F1 with, with AP. So that was, you know, back in the day, man. Uh, and then I think in 2015, we did uh, two watches. We did uh, a watch with, um, with Panerai. Mm -hmm. Which was a uh, uh, yeah beautiful sort of blacked out aluminum marina, um, a four liner as they call it. Um, uh, actually, it's pretty similar to the the, the Panaristi watch, the one nine five, but it had like I guess it was early in that era where vintage loom was kind of a novelty. So we did vintage style loom on that watch, which was kind of dope. And then we did um, uh, a version of the IWC Portuguese Jubilee watch, right? You know, um, and we did, and that was an amazing watch. George Kern, who was the CEO at the time, actually found us 10 year old stock cases from those watches. And, and we, uh, and so we made 10 pieces. I remember that very vividly, yeah. 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 So that brief intro made you a rock star in our industry. And as well in the fashion you do to the rake. But you are one of the most stand-up guys, fun, loving, truly passionate, and knowledgeable. Because I learned every time I read your long posts on Instagram, and I read them, I always learn something. So I love that. And you're just an amazing guy. So we, when we met, I don't know how many years ago, we immediately clicked. You're always stand-up, amazing wife. You have too. Had the honor to meet her in Amsterdam as well. But... Enough of me talking. Just give me a brief rundown who you are. Revo, the rake, Singapore. We'll go through the ace list questions and then we'll do a deep dive on the Revolution magazine. Sure. No, I mean, first of all, thank you so much for those kind comments. You know, I'm sure my mother would disagree with you. She thinks that I'm a bit of an idiot. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, I think it, it's nice of you to say I'm a stand-up guy. I think you are as well. I think the most important thing that, you know, the qualities that we share that I like uh, and that I think is a common um, a quality that all, most of my friends have, or I would say pretty much all my friends have, um, is we don't take each other, ourselves too seriously, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that, that that's one of the things that you have to be careful about. Like, you know, watch collecting is a great hobby, but, you know, sometimes people can get excessively opinionated or or think they just know everything and or or just take it like you know it's a bit of an ego trip and, and it's kind of like dude the one thing i know for sure about watches is the moment you think you know a lot about watches is the moment you close yourself from discovering actually the remaining 90 percent that's actually available to you right so i learn shit all the time i learn shit from everyone from yourself, from uh, you know Frank, from Monochrome, from Robert Yan, from Fratello, from from my friend Andrew, from Time and Tide, from Odinki, from from pretty much everyone, right? And I'm totally receptive to that. I'm super interested in that as well, right? Um, related to uh, Revolution and the Rakes, so Revolution, you know, it was uh, you know the whole idea was was previous to Revolution, there were watch magazines, but in general they were. They were kind of, I, I guess, uh, the term I use sometimes is, is Germanic, which maybe is not fair because Germans can be really fun. Like, I've been in Berlin, I had a great time there. Um, but it's very, a little bit dry and academic, right? You know, you know, um, and we wanted to sort of inject this sort of fun and sexiness and playfulness to watch it. So in the way we portrayed them and so on. I mean, I wouldn't do it today because it's probably not um, as cool in the context of today. But at the time when we launched the magazine, we had a really... How long ago is it, Wei? 2005, right? So we had a really beautiful, yes, we had a really beautiful woman on the cover, and then she was wearing a line of double split, right? So it's like that's that was weird because it's like you have like something you would almost see in a fashion magazine, but then she's wearing a super, um, you know, super technical watch, right? Um, Very dramatic. 
<laughs> yeah, with double, double isolators, you know, he's yeah, just super dramatic. Uh, and then, um, and then when you go inside the magazine, you you see these kind of visuals that you know kind of grab your attention because they're quite provocative. But then at the same time, there's substance to the magazine because the storytelling, while fun, is one in which it's very researched. You know, it's 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 very horological, right? Because I hate it when people, you know, like I, I feel there's two types of journalists again to watch to watch journalism. One are the ones that are definitely like super geeked out about it, um, and they have this desire and thirst to keep you know going and keep learning more. Um, and then the other type are the ones that just really like the fact that it's a cool lifestyle, right? Like they can travel the world and they get brought to really cool junkets and, you know, get endless glasses of champagne and stay in nice hotels. And, and so for them, it's a lifestyle, right? And, and I don't have any, um, you know, disregard or disrespect for the, the latter, um, but I love the people who are in the first category as well, yeah. right? And, and, and I, I always respect people who have, uh, who have and an one The other does it. Sorry, say again. One doesn't exclude the other, does it? No, and not at all. Should... Not at all. Not no. at all. <clears throat> yes. Some of the people that I, I find to be the most fun people in watch journalism are also the least serious. And there's nothing wrong with that as well, right? Like, I think it's kind of cool. Uh, wow. and then, you know, Yes, exactly. Then The Rake uh, is a magazine about classic elegance, um, which I'm sorry I'm not portraying today, but uh, classic elegance meaning that, you know, what is the, your style as you get older and how do you become cooler and more relevant and, and a, the better, better version of yourself as you get older? I think a lot of that relates to understanding the codes of classic style, um, learning about them. And then once you have the rules, you can break them and bend them as you wish, right? Um, but also there's a... Like there's, AP says, right? Yeah, yeah, but there's also like a certain, That's all right. there's a certain ethical dimension that, to that too. Like it's also about having manners and that respecting people. You know, I, I actually think tailoring is, is something that people use to respect themselves, but also to respect others. Like when you wear a really nice jacket, when you go to dinner, you, whether it's expected or not, it's about respecting yourself, but it's also respecting about the other people that, that have shown up to dinner, you know? So I agree. So those are, yeah, those are the two magazines, which have now become, I guess, online companies, which have now become e-commerce businesses, which are now soon going to become a brick and mortar business. So we're launching our first store, actually. Amazing. Yeah. You, um, you guys set up in Singapore now a Revo physical setup, right? Yeah. So we have a... a, a, a yeah, so we have a watch watch bar in Singapore where you can come and learn about watches and see, like, you know, vintage Speedmasters. Amazing. Having, Congratulations. Having, Having nice grown looks good. Yes, but that's actually not going to be. Uh, that's not the store I'm talking about. So we're actually launching our first like brick and mortar full on shop, cool. um, but in a very different part of the world. So can you guess where that part of the world is? London. I uh, know. It's it's surrounded by water. Surrounded by water. Yeah, very blue London, water. Uh, England is surrounded by water. Singapore. Very, very, very blue water. <laughs> very blue. Yes. The Maldives. Yes. Really? Yes. <laughs> I'm not joking. Yes. <laughs> we're, long, we're, we're opening uh, um, a rake men's shop, tropical chic men's store in the Maldives and a tropical oh. chic women's store and then a revolution watch bar. And so basically um, a friend of mine, uh, his family is in hotel uh, development and they bought a reef uh, 40 minutes by, by speedboat from the uh, from Male, the mainland. Um, they've reclaimed four islands. So the first island is the Ritz-Carlton. The second island is uh, Capella, which is their hotel brand. And then the third island is a new hotel they created called Patina. Um, all in, it's 280 villas on the water. Um, and yeah, so it's the biggest project in the Maldives. And then we're, you know, like you go to the Maldives and, and after, you know, your first couple of days of activity, um, like... It, Boredom <laughs> kicks in. Yeah. Exactly, and then you're like, I'm going to go to the, uh, I'm going to go to the the hotel shop, and in a lot of a lot of instances, those hotel shops are not the most exciting. So we were yeah. like, how cool would it be if you walked in and you're like, oh my god, there's all these dope watches I can buy here, right? Like to have actual diving watches, like say for example, cool Panerais, and then five minutes later you can have that watch like on while you're diving. I mean, that's yeah. that's that's the dream, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank cool. you. Thank yeah. you. It fits also the boat brand, so uh, yes, precisely. Yeah, and then also from a, cl a clothing perspective, we want to you know instead of selling you know just like silly things that people will buy just because they're on vacation, sell like beautiful, beautifully made you know Panama hats, or like yeah, like really gorgeous deconstructed linen blazers, you know, yeah. like uh, like that kind of thing, right? Yeah, I mean, and you always forget something, so uh, well, we want to encourage you to come without baggage at all, you know, and yeah. then uh, you do all your shopping there.
Yeah, which I imagine sometimes happens with these destinations when you get on a plane very spontaneously. So amazing. Congratulations, Wei. All right. So the ambition is to stay under one hour. I know it's going to be super difficult. So I'm just going to deep dive into the first question. The ace list question, what watch or jewel is your favorite and why? Uh, I don't have any jewels, um, so I'm going to talk about a watch. I would say my one, my current favorite is this watch. Um, so this is a Cartier, yeah, Tong, Tong, Tong Cintre, um, PS Unique, which was created for me, amazing, uh, and a couple of years ago. Yeah, with a salmon dial and burgundy numerals. And, and why do I love that watch? Well, you know, first of all. I think the Tang Sintre is just like this incredible, like just icon. I mean, if you can imagine in the context of 1921, right? Like even then, wristwatches are only getting popular, and then basically mo the majority of wristwatches are derived from the iconography of pocket watches, right? And then here you have Louis Cartier creating something like so crazily groundbreaking. I mean, a shaped watch with this beautiful curved profile with this, you know, daring, you know, Art Deco styling. And if you look at the the profile of that watch, it's kind of like a optical illusion because it looks yeah. like it's 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 completely curved, yeah. which means like, well, how the hell would they get a movement in there? You know, especially yeah. in the context of 1921, people are like, how the hell would you get a movement in there? Well, actually, what's interesting is the case back is 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 flat, yeah. and it's it's you know up, you know, kind of like yeah. integrated up into the the case. So when you have it on your wrist, you can't tell that the case back is flat. It looks like a completely curved. Um, case. What alloy is it made in? Why gold or this platinum? Is, this is in, in platinum. But yeah. I would imagine, like people who looked at it back then, were just like, oh, "What the hell is that thing? It's crazy, yeah. you know." And I love how audacious that watch is, and, and it's still. And to imagine that it's now this year specifically, one hundred years old, yeah. and it's still as cool as relevant um, as ever. That's amazing. That's amazing. Fact, I the read the book I, by um, Brickle Cartier about the Cartiers. Did you read that book? I know I'm following uh, her on Instagram, but I haven't read her book yet. Well, you I it's it's I amazing. Know, the Tank Book by Franco Coloni. But I'm gonna, you know what? I'm, you've convinced me. I'm gonna order that book. Uh, you should. You should. It's really. It's it's like a journey through history. Amazing. And for us, watch geeks. It's amazing how they developed everything and it really links to your story. So thank you for sharing that. Second question: What did you want to be when you grew up? And you told me the stories where you've been all over the place when you grew up. Yeah, I mean, it sounds funny for an Asian guy, but I, I wanted to be a cowboy, right? Like, uh, I guess, you know, that's, uh, for whatever reason, I was always very attracted to that dimension of American culture. I think also because of, you know, Ralph Lauren, the imagery that I always saw yeah. of him on his ranch and so on. And he's, you know, of course, my hero. And then uh, later in life, I actually got the opportunity to move to Montana and I worked on a commercial cattle ranch there for a year. Um, though, actually, the term cowboy is is an honor. It's like an honor that is bestowed upon just the very top echelon of people that work on a ranch, and everyone else is essentially a ranch hand, right? And so, I was basically a ranch hand for a year. You know, I was, but it was, uh, yeah, it was an incredible experience and one that I, I will always treasure. So, you are very international and also very American. So, you grew up in New York, right? I did, yes. So, how was that? And how did you want to become a cowboy? And yeah. why is Ralph Lauren so much your hero? So um, I, I think uh, growing up in New York was an incredible experience. So I, I um, went to an, a really cool school called the United Nations International School. So my dad was working at the UN. And then so in your class, you've got people, you know, I would say probably 70% of the kids are kids from, you know, people, different delegates that are yeah at the UN. So you meet people from every conceivable country. Um, and, and it's amazing to, to be that, you know, open to other people's cultures when you're young. Then the second thing is um, the UN school taught, it was like, uh, it taught you two languages. It, I wouldn't say it was bilingual, but the, their second like language program was very accelerated. So that's where I began to pick up some French as well, which was, uh, which, you know, I was always enamored with French culture because I watched this film called Manon de Source, right? Um, which the opening scene is Emmanuel Béart, this beautiful actress, and she's tending goats in the countryside naked. And I'm like, ah, dude, I gotta get, I gotta learn French. And then I, you know, because in case I ever go to France and there's some naked goat tending woman like just walking by with her goats, I'm like, I could say, have a call, I strike up. A you being a cowboy. Yes. <laughs> um, so uh, then, uh, how is it that you know? Okay, for me, I would say. Um, it, it, not specific to the cowboy dimension of his brand, but Ralph Lauren, I think, was my hero from an early age because I felt that he was the greatest embodiment of the American dream. 
right? Mm -hmm. and, and the American dream is is a super compelling one still. Mm -hmm. And it's basically about, you know, every country in, in Europe, you know, there you basically they had classes, right? You know, there was a kind of this was a like, leftover from like the feudalism or and and uh, and you couldn't really ascend beyond your, your class, right? And what I loved about the American dream is it didn't matter where you're from, what class you were, what religion you were, what ethnicity you were, um, you could just by your own sort of merit, your own, you know, testicular fortitude, um, and by your own will, like drag yourself to the very top if you had the desire and ability to, right? And people would recognize that success um, regardless of what your background was. Whoever you were now, that's who you were, right? Yeah. And that's who your, and who your children would be in the future. And I, I really love that whole idea, that egalitarianism and that sense of optimism as well. So I think that for me, Ralph Lauren always embodied that. Like even when I saw his imagery, you know, imagery of himself, of his family, or of, of uh, people wearing his clothes, there, it almost seemed like there's this beautiful optimism encoded in, into those clothes. Um, and so, yeah, I remember the the first time I, I ever managed to, you know, purchase a, a Ralph Lauren, you know, iconic, you know, polo player, uh, a polo shirt, right? Yeah. I, I felt so special to have that that shirt. And I remember I, I would hand wash that shirt. I wouldn't even put it in the washing machine because I want it to last forever, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then later, I, you know, I guess, I, I, I don't know why. I mean, I think I love Western movies, you know? Um, I've always loved like all the Clint Eastwood movies, the Sergio Leone movies, uh, but even like classic ones like Red River, The Searchers. Um, and I like that, I guess the individualism of that culture, you know, mm -hmm. I, I was quite a lonely um, a kid. Like I didn't have a lot of friends when I was young. And like that idea of being out like by yourself <laughs> with your horse, your dog, if you had a dog. And, uh, and uh, like, I, I don't know, I felt, somehow, somehow felt that that had, uh, that had some meaning. And then, yeah, after I, I went, so Singapore, um, like Israel, has mandatory national service. Um, actually, our army was set up by Israeli officers. Um, and the uh, the term or the duration is two and a half years. So I had a long time uh, to think about what I wanted to do afterwards. And then I was like, well, you know, I really want to try out this uh, this American adventure of, of living in the, in the West. You know, and it's interesting as someone who lived their entire life uh, until I was in my 30s in, in, in uh in the United States, I hadn't really visited many places except for basically New York and maybe Los Angeles, you know, and a couple yeah. of other other touristic cities. And to go to Montana uh, to experience life there was was a pretty amazing experience. It was actually almost like a, a different country, but I, I loved the experience. Amazing, amazing. So you already mentioned one role model. Yes, yes. Would you want to mention more? Well, I mean, my dad, you know, like I think my dad is uh, one of these guys. He's super, um, he's super optimistic. Uh, he is a guy who, you know, he was he was the first Singaporean to uh, go attend Harvard Law School. He was the dean of his uh, of the law university, uh, the law university here in Singapore before he was 30. He was appointed to the United Nations when he was, I think, 29 or 30, uh, making him, I think, the one of, one of, if not the youngest uh, permanent representative from any country to the, the United Nations. Um, yeah, he was uh, the chairman for the Law of the Sea Conference, so he oversaw the, the, the writing of the International Law of the Sea. Uh, and, you know, he yeah, he's also what I think find really admirable about him, which I'm not necessarily, um, I can't say that I, I have the same ability, but he has the ability to lead people without having to, like, uh, confront or intimidate them, but purely mm -hmm. through uh, by motivation. Uh, yeah, by motivation and positive yeah. reinforcement. That's yeah. like an incredible skill. Like I don't need, you know, it's it's another level. Um, so yeah, you know, uh, I would say my dad. Uh, besides yeah, Ralph, Ralph Lauren, amazing. If you could teleport tomorrow, where would you go? I would go uh, back in time, actually. Um, I, you know, it's funny, I have a really dear friend called Nick Fawkes, and yep. we always talk, talk about why is it that we love this era? I would say from between the 50s to the 70s, right? Mm -hmm. You know, where, you know, and it's all, and of course the people that we, you know, admire the most invariably are the people, you know, like your Jan Agnelli's or your baby Pignatari's, you know, um, these beautifully dressed icons who were romantic swashbucklers, who were, you know, um, style uh, uh, setters, uh, and, and they all kind of played around um, these international communities in the south of France and Mustique and Stad and all that. It's not the the the, the wealth dimension of that, which because quite honestly, like it's funny. I, I 
I love it like everyone else who loves watches. I, I, you know, understand that there is a certain reality to wanting to own nice things. And as I get older in life also, I also, also understand that a certain amount of wealth helps to protect you, mm -hmm. right? And, and protect your family in the future. However, um, uh, I, like, I, I've come to realize I'm not super impressed by wealthy people or just wealth, right? But what I love about that era, it was the last time where wealth and taste really aligned. So when the richest people in the world also have the most epic taste in the world, right? Yeah. You know, where you have Charles Pastiki having like this ball in Venice where you've got like, you know, thousands of like gondolas, you know, floating down like the the the, you know, the, the water to towards the Palazzo Labia. I mean, it's it's incredible. And the I think the joy and irreverence of that period as well, you know, um, uh, the sort of social scene, but also just the early age of like the disco era, um, the music explosion in America and New York in, in particular, which is still my favorite city, where you had like, you know, Studio 54 Uptown, but then, or Midtown, 54th Street, and then you had like CBGBs, um, and then you've got the emergence of like, you know, punk rock, I mean, and you've got like Andy Warhol, and you've got Lou Reed, and you've got, um, you know, Jackson Pollock in the 50s, um, like all that, and so I would like to live in New York, from the 50s to the 70s right yeah. right yeah amazing <laughs> on topic of, of those style times and icon and iconic things and themes just an intermezzo question who inspires you today who do you think that stands out in in these let's say casual times yeah us watch geeks have a very big nostalgia for the old right because mechanical and everything um who who who, who inspires you today who do you think that 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 is a true cool guy i'm not talking about created by marketing departments right yeah so you know, you know i think the thing that you learn you know well, i would say the simple answer to that is still ralph Lauren. And, and and you know how cool is it that later in life like i actually got to meet the person that was my hero mm -hmm. and he actually became kind of a mentor to me i mean that's in, 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 remarkable right yeah it is. Like, you're, you're always kind of warned about meeting your heroes because you know god forbid that they end up not being or you know great people or living up to your expectations but in every single dimension, whether it was his, you know, generosity or his patience or his, you know, his, his, his you know, sort of genuine um, appreciation for the rake. I mean, the first thing yeah. he ever said to me was um, when I was interviewing him for the first cover of the rake, he said, oh, you're the guy that, that made the rake. Um, I uh, always wanted my own magazine, but I don't need it anymore because I found one that I love. And that's yours. So, and, that, and that's such a cool thing to say. You know? yeah. um, and then, yeah, so, you know. I've been lucky enough to strike up a friendship with him, um, yeah. and and we and he's he's an amazing man. He's 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 given me so many important life lessons. Um, I've actually proposed to him that I would like to do a book on him. Yeah, and the and the reason why I want to do a book on him is because he is you know like how everyone today is woke, right? Yeah, but he was like woke way before anyone else was like, or because I, I wouldn't say anyone else was, but before it became fashionable to be woke. He yeah. like eth ethics were such an important thing for him, both from the way he's led his life, but also the way he's given back. Right. Yeah. Like here, here's a man who like upon learning that cancer survival rates in Harlem mm -hmm. are or were worse than the third world, um, mm -hmm. decided to build his, uh, his own cancer hospital in Harlem mm -hmm. to help out that community and then created so many programs to help, um, steer people through the, the their you know treatment in cancer figured out a way to fund the hospital because and so now he's got this charity called pink pony where in october these clothes are made and they're you know the, the proceeds yeah. or the, the profit is given to that's them. amazing so you see i learned something new i didn't know that about him and i'm actually also i was very impressed by ralph lauren as a brand yeah. and as a person um yes. i'm from 79 you're also 70s kid right i'm 69 bro whoa 69 <laughs> Oh, 52 you look younger yeah. than I do. Uh, that's very kind of you to say. I, I drink a lot and I think. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, all right. So, we're a, a decade apart. I grew, uh, our family lived in New York. I traveled there every year. I also yeah. lived there, but only in the early 2000s. I was, was obsessed with the American dream. Yes. Definitely. Yes. And um, growing up, is I got as a kid the love for Swatch G Shock, Air Jordans. I was nice. a of basketball with Michael Jordan. So nice. I still collect them today, Jordan 1s. And nice. Ralph Lauren. So as a yeah. kid, I got a Ralph Lauren polo like you did. Yes. 
and, so and also, family as immigrants in each country that we lived in, because we're all immigrants wherever we moved. Yes. You know, the U.S. He was the embodiment of that dream, the, the American dream. So I understand you, and I feel you, and 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 it's amazing how he crafted his life. So I would definitely buy your book. So please do make that book, write it. Thank um, you. I know he started off selling ties. Yeah. Changed his yeah. name to yes. make it more Anglo-Saxon. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but I didn't know about the charity, and actually, you don't hear so much about him and his brand. I still, my polos used to be Lacoste, Ralph Lauren, but now it's all horses. <laughs> I still stick to Ralph Lauren as well. Um, okay, amazing. So, on topic of books, fifth question What book are you currently reading? Uh, I just finished reading a book called The Border, which is by a great writer called Don Winslow. So, Don Winslow wrote. Uh, he, he, so it, this is all basically like a fictionalization of the American uh, versus Mexican kind of drug cartel situation. Mm -hmm. But it's probably one of the most, like the best researched uh, book I've ever read. And it's interesting too, actually, if you watch um, Narcos, the Mexican, you know, series, mm -hmm. right? Like there's so many things that they clearly were inspired by from these books because yeah. character scenes, so much stuff, right? So there's three of them. The first one is called uh, The Power of the Dog which yeah. is like one of the best books I've ever read. And I go back to it over and over again. And there's like amazing storytelling in it as well. And there's, you know, compelling and romantic stories also. Then the second one is called The Cartel. And then the third one's called The Border. And I'm just waiting for these to become um, made, made into like an epic Netflix, like Game of Thrones, like series where with multiple seasons. But yeah, that's, that's extremely rewarding. And then the other uh, book that I just finished reading um, is a book called Empire of the Summer Moon. Okay. Right. And that's basically about um, uh, like how like Texas like settled, right? Because um, it was quite interesting. Like, so there there is a like the the, the Comanche tribe, right? Uh, mm -hmm. The Native American tribe. They were not like at the top of like the Native American sort of hierarchy in terms of, you know, being a warrior class or anything like that for many, many years, right? Then, and also the other thing to understand is like, um, the horse is not native to North America, right? Yeah. So the way the horse got to North America was because the Spanish brought it there, right? Really? And it's, yeah, so and at some point, yes, and at some point the Spanish like just bailed because of like, they couldn't deal with all the attacks from the Native Americans and so on, but they left all their horses behind. And these horses began mm -hmm. to mul multiply because the conditions of like the the sort of uh, southwest were very similar to the conditions of Spain, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of dry. So it was like the perfect breeding. Uh, and then soon you had like, you know, just like this massive amount, of like seas of horses in the United States, right? Uh, or in, in, in North America. And the, but the first tribe to actually domesticate and master the horse was the Comanche, right? And this, this gave them a uh, level of tactical superiority that was so much higher than everyone else. They became, they were the Mongols, right? Like they basically, because they were mobile, because they could attack on horseback, because they, you know, yeah. are their entire cultures, they were masters of the horse. They became the masters of Amazing. The horse, right? Now, now, then you have this other tribe called the white dudes, right? <laughs> and, uh, and they're trying to, to settle into like what is modern day Texas, right? And, uh, and and so it's, it's interesting because like so for example the term Texas Ranger, um, like we associate Texas Ranger with being um, a lawman, right? Mm -hmm. But actually, initially the Texas Ranger were guys that were so good at keeping people who were trying to stake their claims. So in the old days, like it was so savage out there that they'd be like, okay, bro, if you go out there with a surveyor and you stake your claim, stake it as big as you want, right? <laughs> you can have that land for free. I mean, dude, can you imagine what a, a you know, like yeah. all of us, when you talk about the, like the time machine, people are like, I wish I could go back then and stake out like a million acres of land in Texas and I'd be like, you know, like a land. Yeah. But the problem was the Comanche. <laughs> See, you go out there and try to stake your claim. I mean, they just take you and, you know, torture you horrifically and, and you know, and, and, and you die in the most excruciating way. So, like the it, it became like the likelihood of survival while staking your claim became so low that but then strangely enough there were certain dudes who managed to survive it right and then they became so good at surviving so good at fighting the, the comanche that that they were the ones who were appointed to anyone you know who wants to go survey the land you better take one of these dudes along with you because it improves your likelihood of living by a considerable margin and those guys were the texas rangers I get right? it. So it's like this epic story of the development of America. Sure, there's a cowboy culture component to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. amazing. It's, 
it's cool. It's really cool. Amazing. Um, my next question is, what do you think is going to be the color of this year? And before you answer, I wanted to compliment you on the latest collab you guys did with Bulgari. I used it as a background for today. I loved it. I love the Octofinismo. And you guys took the GMT automatic chronograph and gave it a, let me see if I can show it here up on screen. Maybe Dal is helping us on the background. He can pull it up. It was amazing um, that you did a full Superluminova DAO. So kudos to you guys. And I thank would you. love to hear why you guys designed it that way. Um, yeah, thank you for that, Dala, for bringing it up. Uh, well, I mean, it, it was, uh, it, you know, this watch started with a conversation with uh, Fabrizio Bonamassa, who's mm. an amazing, amazing guy. And I have to also thank uh, John Christophe Babin and Antoine Payne for supporting this project as well. I think the only mistake we made with this watch is we shouldn't have made 25 of them. We should have made 125, mm. right? which was, so I um, need to learn from these <laughs> these lessons. But anyway, the whole idea was like, hey, let's make the ultimate tool watch version of the Octo Finissimo. Um, GMT chronograph because that watch came out and I think it was like uh, 2019 and I thought it was super dope but it was a gentleman's chronograph right yeah so then he was like uh, Fabrizio was like okay cool I get it so let's do um, like a uh, tachymeter on the bezel which also because yeah. the bezel so thin was was actually not that easy to do yeah. then he's like then let's do um, like a like something super visible so maybe like a white dial with like maxi indexes right. And then he's like, okay, that's cool. And then I was like, hey, but if it's a tool watch, we got to loom it, right? So we got to loom, yeah. we got to loom the hands, and we got to loom the indexes. And then you know, these indexes are like, I think they're like, uh, well, the entire dial is zero point two to uh, if it's full titanium, and zero point three if it's like painted um, mm, which means that entire dial is thinner than a lot of just individual indexes. So they couldn't get loom on it because it just yeah. wasn't, it's too small, too thin, right? But actually the indexes on the watches where they have applied indexes, yeah. they're actually galvanically grown and then they were stuck on their like decals, right? Which I thought was incredible. So he was like, okay, but maybe we had, there's another option. And he was the one who came up with this idea of, of just super luminova um, uh, application to the entire dial because it just looks like white, like white paint basically or white yeah, lacquer. Yeah. And, yeah. and and I like that effect so much that I'm actually using that effect on a personal watch that I'm creating as well um, with another brand, which is just cool. a, PS, a PS unique for me, but like, I, I just think it's super dope. And nice. so in terms of what do I think the color of 2021 will be? <laughs> I think it'll be loom color and, and, and I think it'll be pink, these two colors. Pink or salmon? Both, pink and salmon, right? So, okay, I know you, you're a fan of that as well, so yeah, amazing. I think, I, think it, I think it will continue, and, and we're also working on a big project. We're working on um, a charity auction in October cool. called, called the Pink Dial Project, and it's something supported by us at Raking the Revolution, but also by uh, Frank at Monochrome, Robert Yan uh, at Fratello, um, uh, Eleanor Picciotto at the IF yeah. Jewelry, Andrew from Time and Tide, Eric yeah. Kuhn. Uh, yeah my friend Eric Koo, and, and it's basically to ask brands to create one-off watches with pink dials, which will be charity yeah. au charity auction in October and donate to the breast cancer charities. Amazing. Compliments for doing that, really. You guys are always giving back to the community, so stunning. Uh, you know, thank you. I mean, it's it's important to us. You know, As yeah. I know, it's important to all those dudes that I just mentioned. So, Yeah. You know, and that's what I love about the watch community. It's a, a community that, that – of friendships, uh, giving back, sharing knowledge, and, and doing good together. So that's amazing. Last question, and it's a rhetorical one because I just mentioned that that I had the honor to meet the missus in Amsterdam when we had an amazing lunch. Um, that's, the, that's, my favorite, that's my favorite memory, bro. It's, it's just like hanging out with just chill people, like having laughs. You know, like to me, that's always like the best. And so I, I love the lunch that we had at Soho House. I love the fact that we're having Negronis and Bitter Ball. And like, uh, like those things are dope incidentally, right? Like, I don't know if you guys, uh, it, 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 for those of you who are not, have not visited Amsterdam and haven't had a Bitter Ball, ball in or Bitter Ball, like, yeah. Bitter ball. yeah you, you need to just get on that as soon as you can travel again. That That's like a freaking like croquetta on steroids. It's. <laughs> It's fucking dope, man. Yeah. Um, so that plus a bunch of Negronis um, and a bunch of wine, that was such a great day. Um, yeah. super, super fun, man. 
Yeah, amazing. I'm still in touch with our buddy from Mess of Blues, by the way. So he's a, he's a super cool guy, right? Yeah. yeah, he's a super cool guy. He made a nice pocket square pochette with watches yeah. on it. I know with, with our buddies from Amsterdam Vintage, of Amsterdam nice. Watch Company. So yeah. he's a cool guy. So yeah, nice, so it's, nice. it's good karma. You see, you keep on uh, meeting each other, and uh, it's a network of friends. So totally. And then the uh, I, I guess the other thing that was super dope was we managed to luck into getting a reservation at Noma, right? Like, uh, like we could, it's obviously like the hardest reservation to get. So we couldn't, you know, we, we didn't even go with any expectations of going. And then, um, I think they flashed up. I don't know how they do this, but uh, like, like there was a two seats at a common table free that night. And then we rang up and then she was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Those seats just went. But then she was like, Oh, but there's a table that just canceled for dinner tomorrow. Do you guys want that? And I was like, fuck yeah. So then we got to go eat at uh, Noma, which. To be fair, like I'm not a big like fancy food guy. Like I love to eat, but I like you know more traditional cuisine, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I have to say that that experience was dope. It was it was super, super fun, and they were really nice too. Amazing, amazing. So thank you for answering the seven the Aces questions. Um, the questions of the viewers are pouring in. I want to maybe five more minutes talk a bit about both media actually. So you were a super early innovator you you took the whole watch industry to the next level um i think that in a certain way you did that also for sartorial menswear as well you carved out a niche there uh took it from print to multi-platform media to omni-channel retail and you're doing full circle so you're going to physical um you have an amazing team you're it's like you're you eat uh, atomic power for breakfast or something you're you're on steroids you have so much energy your output of of content is also amazing very authentic thank very you raw very high quality because because your level of writing is artistic oh, it's very eloquent true. but also very qualitative which are two different things so, and you do that both on the watchmaking side and on the fashion sartorial side. Um, so where are you taking these companies in this media today? Where do you think it's gonna go? Um, now that media became retail, us retailers are creating content, right? You're coming yes. on my show. Yes. Uh, there's a convergence. I think the convergence is, is and I think it's like you aren't like, a, you know, already a content creator as a retailer you're already behind the game and i think that if you're not already a, in some ways or another an e-tailer or a retailer mm -hmm. and you're in content creation you're already a little bit behind you know and, I, and I, there's a lot of guys from amsterdam that are crushing it even that that dude from amsterdam vintage watches i mean he's, he's kicking ass you know i have yeah. to say like his, his content is really strong yeah. um and then obviously you know our two friends from uh, from journalism as well um robert yan and, and frank yeah. um they're they're also and I think there, Robert Yan just launched his first limited edition with Oris, which I know he sold out. So he's super yeah. happy about that. And yeah. I'm sure there's many more to come, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, the convergence is already here, right? I, you know, one thing that may potentially happen is like, uh, because you've got like, for example, in America, this juggernaut like that is Hodinkee, you know? Uh, and they're amazing content creators, but they've become massive e-tailers as well. Yeah. I'm interested to see if there will be a convergence in terms of like, um, uh, like two strong partners, um, you know, like, you know, getting married to some degree, right? Like, so whether you had an amazing retailer and then they took a media company and they're like, okay, now we have this, right? Because I think that it's a win-win, right? And that's, so that's potentially very interesting. Then as far as we're concerned, what are we getting into? Um, we kind of like, I don't want to say we're, we're doing our own brands, but uh, like, for example, with clothing, one of the things that we realize is that to be able to control the entire, um, supply chain from beginning to end is super important. Mm -hmm. And so what we've decided to focus on with all of our projects for our own brand is accessibility, right? Yeah. Because I think that one of the reasons why, you know, classic style or tailoring, for example, people, you know, younger people don't necessarily connect with it as much as also it's really expensive, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like, you know, if you could get a, a dope pair of Jordans for like, like 150 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not gonna get like, you know, a pair, a nice pair of, let's say, whatever, double monk straps or, or whatever for 150 bucks, right? You're not going to get a beautiful jacket. Well, actually, I would say suits of lies kind of changed the game. But yeah. anyway, 
So one of the things that we're doing is, is we're working with one of the most famous tailors in the world, uh, which is Lorenzo Schifanelli. Mm -hmm. And he also understood that um, we're in a war for the hearts and minds of the next generation, right? Yeah. So everyone is going to streetwear because it's super relevant for them, but also it's accessible to them, right? And he's like, we need to do something to attract the next generation and get them to experience tailoring now. So we are going to uh, create clothing, a clothing line with him. So Lorenzo Schifanelli times the rake and price it in the way that's the most accessible ever like you know Amazing. so be below that, like a thousand euro for a chiffonelli suit for example yeah. um and then we've got our own clothing line which is called the ray taylor garments mm -hmm. um, and that's like even more radical like you know all made in italy all made from the best fabrics made the best construction but we want to price our jackets at like 600 euro right you know something like that so that like um younger people who because we have so many followers and so many of our dms are from young people who like love the idea of the rake love the style of the rake but also feel it, it's prohibitive in terms of getting into it so i think that's super important for the next for the for the immediate future um we're also going to be launching our own brand in negronis because <laughs> because well, it's funny because I think over the course of the last year, the Negroni suddenly gained the significance beyond being just like a drink and somehow a drink related to tutorialism because I guess everyone that went to PT Omo, you know, the Negroni was invented in Florence and yeah. everyone just drank, drank Negronis and on social media that kind of exploded. So every guy in like a cool suit had a Negroni in his hand and it kind of became the symbol for like loving that kind of life, you know, looking, yeah. loving that nostalgic life about like dressing beautifully, having great manners, uh, having camaraderie. And over 2020, it even became like this banner of solidarity it's like hey let's all we're all in these dark times together but fuck it let's drink negronis and keep our attitudes positive right yeah. and so like i love that and then we have a, a really dear friend called paul feig um who's an incredibly well-dressed dude but is also a very successful film director he, he directed bridesmaids and ghostbusters amongst others uh and he has his own gin brand so we decided to work together to create a negroni brand and that'll yeah. be launching launching probably in a month or so um so and then we've got our project in the maldives so and then we got some more limited edition watches coming coming your way. So hopefully I, people will like them. Amazing. Congratulations on all these projects. And um, I think the, 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 the key of the success is because it's authentic. And you guys embody that uh, lifestyle. And I think you listen very well also to your audience, don't you? Uh, you're on the pulse of the beat. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, people always ask this question, like, how do you navigate, like, the challenging relationship between commerce and editorial? And it's simple. For me, it's like you can have even more edit uh, editorial integrity if the stuff you're selling is good. Right. If you're trying to sell garbage, then of course you've lost your, and you say it's good, then of course you've lost your integrity. But if like my, I say my stuff is dope and you buy it and you're like, dude, you're right. This is dope. Like this jacket is amazing. I can't believe it looks as cool and it costs as much. Right. Or I can't yeah. believe you guys are losing, using lower piano fabric on a jacket, on a suit that costs under a thousand dollars. Um, then like, you know, we've done something cool. And then the same thing for the watches. Right. Which I also feel like all the watches don't have to be expensive. Yeah. Like, we're going to be launching obviously with like brands like Baltic this year. And, uh, and honestly, that's like one of our most exciting watches, like for me, yeah. like, under a thousand dollars, but like freaking dope, you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, Amazing. And, I think, and I think the last thing I would say to that is, is you have to be conscious about how you price things. Right. Like, like, the way we've always talked about it with brands is like, we get that it's a limited edition, but let's not charge a premium for it because like, you know, I, I want to give back to my client, right? Like I think that's, yeah. that's important, right? Yeah. Amazing. So enough for me asking questions. Um, I'm going to ask Dala to help me out with the questions. I'll pull up the first one because the next guest is Sylvain Berneron. Wow. Creative director of Brightening. Nice. Uh, a Petro head. And you know what collab they launched last week? The days. Yeah. So he sent in the first question to me on Instagram yesterday asking you, Way mentioned a few times he was into motorcycles as well. Yeah. I, I, tell I, us more about it. Yeah, you know, like I, I, I don't know why, but like when I since I've been a kid, like uh, I always liked um like I always like tattoos, which were hard to get when you're young. Um and I liked stuff, you know, like like I like punk rock and I love motorcycles, right? Uh and that is also challenging for someone that's not very well coordinated, right? <laughs> But um, yeah, I love I love motorcycles. I don't know why. And also, I remember the very first bike I ever bought was like 
was probably one of the more challenging motorcycles to own. I totally regret selling it, which I had to because I left Los Angeles, but I had this, the most perfect, like most immaculate um, 1968 Triumph Bonneville, which was, it was, just, and it started like on first kick every time, but I love that bike. And I just love the, you know, it's kind of like when you're a little kid and you get on a bicycle for the first time and this yeah. like sense of, and I like bicycles too, like that sense of freedom. Yeah. Right. Like love, like limitless possibility of like, you know, kind of like that cowboy thing where you're like out on uh, out in the uh, on the on the road and, and anything can happen. But you're just connected to this machine. Right. Mm -hmm. So my challenge now is I have because I just got a new the puppy um, and she's a long haired miniature dachshund is I have to figure a way to get her like in a little backpack or like front front pack with like dog. They have goggles. They're called doggles. Yeah. Right? And, then, and, and then she might need her plugs because my bikes are a bit loud. Um, and then, yeah, since I was a kid, I always liked British motorcycles and I always liked um, Harley Davidson's as well, right? And, uh, and I've had a bunch of different ones. So right now I have uh, the last of the Dyna. The, so those are the external kind of fork model Dyna, uh, uh, Harley Davidson's. It's called a Lowrider S. Um, mine's got a 117 cubic inch engine on it, which is, is pretty dope. Um, it's got Brembo brakes. It's got like Olin shocks on it. It's just, it's just probably the best handling Harley I've ever ridden, which probably isn't saying very much because most Harleys ride like shit. <laughs> but but it, it actually is a genuinely great riding bike. And then I've got um, the old, an older, uh, air cooled but modern Triumph Thruxton. Nice. And then in, in London, I've got three, four bikes which I haven't ridden in a year because <laughs> I haven't been able to travel. But I've got a 1977 Harley XLCR, uh, which is that cafe racer Harley. So I don't know if you ever, if you remember a movie called Black Rain, right? Yeah. So Michael Douglas is like riding this like cafe racer Harley, and I was like watching that as a kid. I'm like, when I grow up, I'm gonna get that fucking bike. Amazing. So I, I have that bike. Um, it's uh, it was running super hot. So hopefully my mechanic uh, has managed to like I don't know play with the carburetor jets, and he's put an oil cooler on it. So hopefully it's better. Uh, I have a, a beautiful 1972 Norton Commando as well because I always wanted a Norton. Uh, with the yellow, it's a roadster, which is because I think when I was growing up, I always wanted a fastback, but the roadster is super dope and it's yellow, which is like the color that I always associate with Norton's. Um, I have a an old uh, BMW that's been made into a street tracker called uh, mm -hmm. by this by, by this amazing guy called Kevils, K E V I L S. Um, it's just like a lava orange uh, street tracker, which I just really dig. And then for one, I must, oh, yeah, yeah, dude. <laughs> And then I have a Triumph. I have a 1967 Triumph TR6C uh, competition. So that's with the high pipes, and then it's got like a little skid plate on the bottom uh, for off-road ride. I don't ride off-road, but it's just uh, it's just a cool bike to have, right? So, yeah. I, you know, I, I and I have resisted selling them because I don't ride them at all, like because I don't. Well, I haven't been in England for a year, uh, but I just think they're cool. And I and it was again, I was inspired by Ralph Lauren because I was like. Um, he was like, when I had money, I just bought the cars that I liked. And I, I never regretted that because today, when I look at my car collection, I would never be able to purchase, I mean, he's being modest, obviously, he obviously did, but I would never, never be able to purchase them all over again because the car prices have risen so much. And yeah. also really great cars have become super rare, right? So yeah. for me at one point where if I saw a nice bike, I'd be like, yeah, I'll just grab it, you know? Um, and then I had uh, like a little of a bit of a foray into Ducatis as well, but um, I was pretty sure that, that I was like, I would die if I continue to ride Ducatis just because they were so fast and I'm so uncoordinated. So, yeah. If you would buy a modern one, would it be a monster? Uh, I had a monster. Um, I had a monster, what was it called? S4RS. It was like uh, the carburetor, uh, sorry, the the uh, liquid cooled one um, yeah. with, with the radiator on it, which I thought, but otherwise just completely naked. That was a super dope bike. But they, you know, they like Ducatis run really, really hot, and you're in Singapore, your leg is scorching, and like, you know, you can't find neutral, and like the freaking like, uh, <laughs> like it's hard to even like just roll at a normal speed. Like you either yeah. it's all either full on or full off, and you know, yeah. um, and I'm old, right? Like I decided I'm, you know, I'm 52 now. I just want to ride to have fun. I don't want to ride to get myself in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah um, I feel you. I feel you. All right. Thank you so much. Sylvain, I hope that answered your question. Dala, may I ask you to... Uh, oh, Sylvain, great job on the uh, Deus um, uh, the top time, incidentally. Uh, you, you killed it, dude. Yeah, that's cool, huh? All right. So Abdul is asking on YouTube, what are your thoughts on a grill watch concept? Is it better to get one yeah. grill watch or several awesome ones? You know, it's funny that like a lot of people um, ask, like think about this a lot, like and um, the 
the watch that they all like that people um, usually talk about being the Grail is uh, like the Paddock, the five zero zero four, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I was just telling my next call. I'm going to be late. No problem. No problem. Yeah, um, and I, you know, I guess like everyone else, I've kind of like toyed with that idea as well. But I think that it's also not healthy for you to have like all your shit like like kind of like focus on one watch, right? Like it, you know, part of the 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 joy of having watches is that you get to experience different styles and different like you know aesthetics and different kind of you know, you know, movements. I mean, you know, listen, right? Like we're already in a world where we don't get to have multiple wives anymore, like like we did in the old days. Um, so like for us, I, to me, like the, not, not that I would want to, uh, but, but, the, but the, <laughs> the idea of variety and this idea of like uh, emotional exploration of every single type of watch is super interesting to me, right? Like, like, I don't think of people as being purely speedy guys, even though speedies are dope. Like, I don't think of people being only Cartier guys, even though mm -hmm. Cartier is great. I don't think most people would imagine. Well, okay. There's some people that like, like very much paddock people. Right. Mm -hmm. But, and I, paddock's probably one of my favorite brands, but like, I would love to have other things in that. I would love to have yeah. modern watches like an Uber yeah. or, or Richard Mill or a Debethune or an MBNF. Like, I think those yeah. are super interesting too. Right. I would love to have micro, um, like, you know, kind of like, like uh, independent watches as well. Like, uh, you know, I think Laurent Ferrier is really cool. Um, yeah. But there's even like a whole new breed of like, of, of, of guys like Reshep and so on like that that are, yeah. are you know, cool with the Cronenfelds, dude. Like I don't have one of those and I would love to have one of those, right? The only problem is like, I finally called them this year and I was like, hey dude, I think I'm ready to buy one of your, uh, you know, your, your Rementoir watches. They're like, dude, we, we don't have any more. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, fuck. No, these guys are on fire. Their their books are full. I think they're ahead more than 12 months. So it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, it's amazing. All right. Thank you so much, Abdul. And thank you, Way, for answering that. Dalo, who's next? How are you on time, Way? Do you need to cut off at. Uh... Can we do one more? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, we have loads more. So we'll have uh... a lot of angry viewers. So, Dala, pick a good one, please. Okay. Dan de Groot asks on YouTube. Who would you say is colliding wealth and taste in the best way currently? It's a great question. Um, I don't know, man. Like, I guess the probably the people that are colliding with wealth and taste in the best way currently are people that you don't really see, right? You know, um, I guess because everything today is so in your face and so accessible through social media that I think that that's maybe the nicest thing is that you, you kind of don't, you don't see it, right? Like it's private. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think that that's important as well. It's probably healthier as well. Um, so, I mean, there's some beautifully dressed people in the world, you know, um, again, I, I, I still think, uh, you know, Ralph Lauren, uh, again, is, is, well, actually he's an amazing example because you never see him like out of parties or even when, you know, he was a bit younger and so on like that, nor, nor do you see his, his children, you know, Andrew, yeah. David, or, um, Dylan, okay. yeah. you know, like I think that discretion is incredibly important. And I, think that, yeah. I think, yeah, I think that that is kind of like taste today, right? Because again, everything is just a little bit too public today. Mm. Right. Beautiful. That's a beautiful ending to our amazing session. Wait, I want to thank you so, so much. I really, really had fun and I hope to have, welcome you back on the show again. Thank uh, you, sir. Have an amazing day. Send my love to the missus. She's wonderful and hope to welcome you guys soon in Amsterdam. With pleasure. I can't wait, man. Bitter ballins and Negronis on me, brother. Take care. Amen. Take care, bro. Take care. Bye-bye.